the most successful CEOs or owners have very strong values that matter a lot to them. Mm -hmm. And they try to surround themselves with people that share those values. And yep. the company ends up intrinsically taking those values on. Yep. And if everyone understands what those values are, and it's like a, a reliable compass that they never sway, yep. like there's a lot more longevity probably to that um, than someone that's trying to balance being and behaving differently mm -hmm. in life A or life B. Hello, everybody. This is the Winning in Winnipeg podcast, where I talk to top performing business owners, executives, entrepreneurs, and local Winnipeg celebrities. I get to learn who they are and how they think, and I get to hear their perspective about what's really going on in Winnipeg and their businesses. Today on the podcast, we have Kyle Romaniak, CEO at Vantage Studios, CMO at Culture Card, and so many other positions that we can hopefully hear about. Kyle has been heavily involved in the Manitoba Chamber of Commerce on the board of directors, as well as past president on the board of directors of the Dream Factory charity here in Winnipeg. Kyle first trained as a graphic designer, but his knack for entrepreneurship and business has seen him become quite the force here in Winnipeg. Kyle, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we've known each other through the Dream Factory, uh, and I know Donovan, yeah. your, your partner at Vantage. Uh, but diving deeper and learning more about you, especially on LinkedIn was just like, holy Moses, there's a lot going on over here. So, okay, we'll start from the start ish. You started in graphic design. So graphic designer by trader, by training, uh, take me through how that looked coming out of school and, you know, just jumping into the workforce. Sure. I, I grew up in a, a family of an entrepreneur where he had a job, worked for someone else for probably from when he was five years old until he was probably in his maybe early 20s. Doing? Uh, he, many different jobs, but he ended up in a trade bindery job working at a place where they'd bind books, okay. fold maps, things like that. Okay. And he went to work one day and there's a padlock on the door. He had no job. Mm. He ended up finding out what was going on did what he needed to do. And he took over that business and ran it and he ended up retiring and selling it to his partner. So I kind of grew up in a world of just knowing him going into work really early, coming home really late and just constantly being the one running the business. So uh, that's kind of the influence that I had growing up uh, into through school up through to high school. Even I was always into art and doing things that were art related. My first business was probably a t-shirt business when I was probably in grade five, something like Which that. Which has now become all the trend. Right, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now that's that's what TikTok that's tells what you to do. Does, yeah. yeah. So um, kind of always interested in entrepreneurship, yeah. but always design. Ended up uh, going through school and college at Red River. Started doing freelance work while in college in first year. And that just morphed into my first business when I graduated. I started up a company called Gator Designs. That ended up going through a name change to become Cocoon Branding. And eventually we did a lot more stuff and now I'm at Vantage, but always in that same industry for over 26, 27 years yeah. now. Um, and through all of that, there's always opportunities where it's like, oh, what if we did this? What if we did that? So new business ideas percolate. And I've got a number of ideas that have been percolating for many years. Other things that we've started doing or trying with other people, um, like Culture Card you mentioned. Yeah. And just after time goes on and the environment in the marketplace changes, there seems to be the right timing for certain things. So this year we might be launching five businesses that I'll, I'll be a part of in some shape or form. Crazy. So let's dive into Vantage a little bit. Uh, take me through, you know, how it was when it first started versus where you guys are now. Yeah. I mean, when we, uh, I guess when I started my companies, which ended up sort of merging in with Vantage, okay. it was always about, um, designing what a business might need to help them grow uh, in their market, whatever stage of business they might be in. It might be needing logo design, they might be needing advertising, website, social, no matter what it was, based on times, things would change. But yeah. it was always about what do they need to help uh, resonate with the market, the target audience, make sure they've got top of mind awareness, and just how do you look at improving that customer experience. Uh, over the past 
several years uh, through pandemic. A lot of things have changed in the marketplace with most industries. Yep. Um, we used to always have agency full of people. Um, we no longer even have a physical space. It's all remote um, people. So, yeah. um, but also the way that we've evolved what we do over the pandemic, it used to be a lot of in-person things like workshops. We are now doing those remotely so we can have clients that are, have teams scattered around the world that we can do collaborative sessions together. Nice. Um, so we're finding that the strategic component of what we were doing is the area that we really deliver the most value for our clients. Okay. And we're looking at reshaping how we deliver our service and go to market um, with something brand new very soon. So COVID played a very interesting forced transformation on you guys. Yeah, I think it did uh, a lot of people. Uh, I was going to say everybody, but a lot of people were probably forced through a 10 year time warp yeah. uh, with it. Right. So a lot of the things that weren't delivering value for people um, that they accepted. Yeah. It was a, a way that it was kind of forced upon them to be like, well, we don't need to do it that way anymore. Right. Um, and I think there's been a sort of domino effect since then that a lot of people are maybe a little bit more open to change than they would have been before. Yeah. Um, and it's enabling a lot of new industries or um, business models to emerge that maybe would have had a tougher, a tougher uphill climb before. Um, but it seems like the market's a, a lot more open to embracing those changes. Yeah. From an owner's perspective, how do you, how are you managing uh, employee expectations? How, how is that different from physical location to uh, them working remotely? Uh, it's definitely um, a shift from what we used to rely on physical um, spaces or, or physical walls with all the information that we needed to stay organized in one place. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of innovation in the digital space though with software that you can use that enables you to functionally do what you need to do to stay on the same page. Right. Um, we've gone through a lot of changes where Things used to be, here's your stuff. Here's what you need to work on today. Uh, we've evolved into weekly milestones instead of daily, where people are a little bit more autonomy, uh, where they can manage what their tasks or milestones might be in a week. Okay. And they look at what's going on on the Monday, sort of understand and agree like, yeah, that's reasonable. I can get that done. And it makes sense that I'm the one to be performing those tasks uh, this week. And then come Friday everything got done or some things didn't get done and understand why and how do we adjust and shift so that we can learn from what didn't get done that we thought might get done. Right. And how do we make next week better and prevent whatever uh, predictions were a little bit off? How do we predict a little bit better into the future and just a constant sort of growth mindset across the whole company, yeah, which yeah. is not what we had before the pandemic. A lot less pants being worn. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah, no, we're, um, we've definitely looked at how, um, and how do we scale? And with, like I said, with a lot of other businesses launching this year, how do we make sure that nobody gets stretched too thin Yep. and how does everyone stay in their lane and understand like what's too much and, yep. and people being very, um, aware of their capabilities and helping us make sure that we navigate these changes carefully, but at the same time, give us the opportunity to move quickly with everyone understanding the big picture vision of everything and how they fit into a big picture and the day to day. Has there been people that haven't bought into it or Absolutely. that didn't work very well? Yeah. yeah. No, we had, uh, we went through a training, a self-reliance training, the Harada method with our team. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people, um, probably sound, thought it sounded great at the very beginning. Oh. And as we started getting into it, there's some people that really jumped in with both feet and some people were a little bit hesitant and other people resisted. Um, we found that we need a certain sort of mindset within our companies. Um, if someone's open to change, open to learning, open to failure oh. and sharing openly with what went well and what didn't go well. Yeah. Um, but Ultimately, everyone is there to support everyone and everyone is there to grow and learn every day. Um, if that's not you, it's, you're just not going to fit into that culture. Right. Who is your ideal client with, with Vantage? And, and what is the typical journey like when they, they first start up with you? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess Vantage as the entity that everyone has kind of come to know uh, over the past 25 years of being an agency Vantage for around probably 15 to 20. Um, 
the agency model and the do the work for you um, and the types of execution work that we are doing, we're just not that motivated by it anymore. Yep. Um, we found when we do our workshops and we talk to people about their business and their vision and what are the pieces that they're missing? What are the pieces that they have? Who are the people that they can rely on? That, um, that's, that's for the owners. That's for the, the employees that, or do you find that it's just mostly for like their marketing and branding people? And It would normally be for the owners, key executive, uh, first to have okay. that buy-in. Yep. And then involve everyone from the front lines to key stakeholders, partners, investors, any any key stakeholder that has a perspective okay. that should be considered so that the plans that we're making to help them identify what are your goals, what are they documented as, um, what's going to get in the way, hold you back, what's going to help you get there faster yep. or reduce the risk. If we are only thinking about what the owner is aware of, there's a limited viewpoint on that yeah. and the plans that we make are going to be missing something so the broader that perspective which we call the vantage point workshops if we have as Very many clever. vantage points as, as possible mm -hmm. then we should be able to make a more rock solid plan and what we were doing for clients in the past was we were developing the plan with them and we were executing it for them yeah. and they weren't involved in the execution really other than approvals um, we're looking at shifting the model so that we're working with you instead of doing the work for you and trying to find an ideal client that is someone with an internal team, someone with an internal team, whether that's one or many people in marketing sales, uh, whatever departments they have. Yeah. And ideally it's an organization that could have 50 to 500 people in the organization. Yep. And they're looking for, um, getting someone with like 25 years experience in a certain area. So for me, it might be like a CMO type marketing role. Mm -hmm. um, if it's the finance side, maybe it's the CFO, or maybe it's a COO, but maybe the company or the organization isn't at the size where they could afford someone very senior, very experienced in that role. So they've got roles filled just under that level of seniority. Yeah. And they'd like to tap into someone with that level of expertise once a month, once a week, whatever that might be. Yeah. So they're not having to pay for it every day, full time, but they're like tapping into it as much as they need to get the, the right sort of guidance or direction so that th their entire team m moves forward in the most effective way possible with the right guidance, but yeah. not having to pay for it full time. Yeah. So that's where we've kind of looked at adjusting our services and now moving Vantage away from saying, you know what, we were an agency, we want to move actually into a completely new space and we just want to do this consulting full time and find other people like us that can provide that fractional service mm -hmm. and launch that as a completely new company from Vantage. So that's one that we will most likely launch next week. Beautiful. That's exciting. Um, to me that, I mean, the first thing that comes up is is when you are doing something completely for somebody that they have almost a scapegoat to blame somebody for if, if it doesn't go well. And if it does go well, then they can, yeah, they can take all the, all the accolades for it. Um, it's very smart from the consulting model or from having somebody uh, investing into it with you in that, you know, you can really, you can really um, align interests, I would say. Yeah, and I think what we're seeing a lot in the market now is a lot of people can't afford to hire all the big salaries. They can't afford to hire an agency to do everything they'd like to get done. Mm -hmm. But they have an internal team that they trust and they like and they w believe can do really great things, but they might not have all the experience that it would be nice for them to have or right. the confidence in knowing what to do. Uh, and they really wish they could have their internal team mm -hmm do more without having to spend much more. So instead of us being hired like an agency, we are hired as a consultant to empower their internal team, give them guidance, understand what training they need, understand if there's a certain capability they should have in-house that they don't and help them hire and train the right person to best utilize their overall budget as yeah, a company yeah. or an organization. So there's certain activity like social media that a lot of companies hired social media agencies to do. And some of them, maybe that's the right way to go. But for a lot of organizations, they really need every single day, someone being there producing content and engaging with their audience yeah, yeah. that it's too hard to do when you're one step removed from that organization. 
Yeah. So if an agency could work with an internal team, help give them the tools and the training they need to perform the day to day activities, and the agency is working on what's next quarter, what's next year, what are the bigger moves that we're doing. And with us kind of bridging the, dif the difference between those two things where we want a consultant to work with their team yeah. 101 and give them the guidance and the training instead of having to hire out to an agency to do it for them. Yeah. And identify if there is really unique scenarios where we need to hire an agency to do X, Y, and Z, we will source them, we will hire them, we will give them the creative direction they need to really do amazing work where a lot of companies, they don't have the knowledge you need to give an agency really clear direction. Right, yeah. So you mentioned 50 to 500 is kind of like where you're you're pointing. Um, was that always the case? Or is this just a new, direct, like, was this, it always, did you start out big or did you start out with really small clients? We would have started out with very small clients, but we've worked with the Red Bull, Good Life Fitness, a lot of other larger brands, Scotiabank, Okay. at the agency level. Yep. And normally for those really big ones, you're providing a very niche service offering where you're providing something specific to what they need, where their yep. AOR, their agency of record, isn't um, overseeing that piece of that business. They're okay. overseeing a higher level of brand, higher level of awareness, but something specific, they're not really working on that. So it ends up being sort of a special project that's important to that brand, but they need to find a niche agency that's built right to do that one thing right yeah um and then for the smaller companies we're doing the entire marketing plan you know, executing everything um and if they're bigger but not too big they'll have their own internal team that we're collaborating with yeah. but we're still doing pieces that we're doing for them so that's why we feel that vantage as it's been known will be maybe shutting that one down mm -hmm. and launching something new with a completely new offering that is big news it's very exciting do you find that, how different are you finding the recommendations and, and, and the direction that you guys are, um, pushing people between small agencies and very large agencies in the terms of like quantity versus quality or, um, you know, different platforms that, that you want to push them on and, and their messaging and stuff like that. Is, is it very different from, from large entities to small? Yeah, I think every company will be unique, whether it's big or small, or what industry they're in or what stage of business they're in. Um, like if you're in the growth stage, scale or exit, if you're a private company, you're going to be needing marketing and sales to work together in a different way. Right. Um, the larger companies are going to have a lot of things in place already with existing partners and you have to understand the landscape of the big picture and which needle can you move mm -hmm. and what are the right things to do. Um, but it feels like every single business is a complete custom scenario. Okay. Um, so it's hard to say every... It's like every house we build. Yeah. <laughs> very, very custom. Yeah. Do you think that the... the So maybe not just the people you work with, but the, the business community in general, do you think that they understand, like truly understand branding and marketing and the difference between the two and how to incorporate it, how to message it? Is that something that you find that they actually know, or is that something that you guys are coming in and, and almost educating and teaching about? I feel like it's probably very rare that someone understands what it is. And it's even more rare that they know how to implement it well. Okay. So uh, we have one CEO that we're speaking to right now that he completely gets it, values it very much, yeah. uh, has internal teams, has gone through many different people over the years, has never been able to get that feeling that his brand's at a 10 out of 10. Yeah. Go to the website, it looks really good. There's a lot of really great things about everything that they do. It's just not that, that thing that's hard to explain that difference, but you can just feel the difference. Mm -hmm. How do you get that in place? Um, for someone to feel like they understand it and value it, but just don't know how to get it there, yeah. that's probably the most aware person that I've ever met. Um, but typically, um, it's not a valued thing. Yeah. Um, and what we found is the marketing background that we have can apply to cultures internally at an organization. It doesn't have to be about external marketing. All okay. right. So some people I've spoken I've spoken to recently, they've uh, said that there's departments that won't speak to each other. There's sales and marketing. <laughs> they want to completely so you guys are the counselors that come in and, and replace it. Oh okay, yeah. Um. So feeling like the the training that we've gone through with the self reliance training understanding how to get people on the same page, 
Um, looking at the stats in the world of like 50% of people don't know what's expected of them at work, including the managers, mm-hmm. there's this disconnect. And maybe working remotely has, has made that number multiply to what it used to be. Um, so Do you notice was, the difference between corporate and private? Do you think that those ratios change? You know what? I doubt it. I doubt they would change. I okay. mean, the people uh, are people. People are people. Yeah. Um, and I've been to conferences with multi-billion dollar companies where they still have like 10% of them are doing onboarding well or whatever the numbers are, right? It's just the, it doesn't matter what size company you are, everyone has challenges that they're ignoring or challenges that they're, they're tackling head on. Um, and then a whole bunch of things that they're just not even aware of. So I feel that whether you're a corporate or a private, there's some stuff that you're just not going to know about because you're not aware of it. Uh, But most of the companies that we've talked to, the owner has a very clear discipline and expertise in a certain area. And it's very unlikely that they're going to be an expert in finance and marketing and sales and operations and the list would go on. Right. So if they don't have that person that can understand and comprehend the vision of that CEO, and then understand how do we get the rubber to meet the road with the team that we have, that's where we're seeing this fractional role can be plugged in and it's going to be different for every company, what they need and when they need it. Okay. So can you explain the difference between marketing and branding? I think this is something that depending on who you talk to, they might say one is above the other, right? But for me, branding is something where it's understanding what is it that you want to mean to people and how are you valued? Um, where marketing is helping communicate uh, to people and how are you going to reach them in what way? Um, but you could say that marketing strategy could include what's the brand positioning? How are we going to differentiate from the other brands? Yeah. What does the brand mean? How is it going to resonate with which target audience? Marketing could be overall strategy and brand is a pillar inside of there. Yeah. I've, I've often heard the word feel to go with brand. Like how, how does somebody feel when they see your stuff or hear about you or, you know, how do they feel when they see your stuff? That's how I've, I've, I've heard branding oh, how people des- often described. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's how you feel. I mean, I feel it's, I feel, <laughs> um, it's probably a mixture of things, right? Where there's the, how you feel emotionally and then what you think logically mm. where branding I think is usually trying to reverse engineer that journey that you want to have in someone's mind and then build that roadmap and then try to implement it the best that you can to control it. Um, where a lot of people just let their brand happen. Right. Um, so if you can try to control your brand and build a brand that you want to be known as Mm -hmm. it takes a lot of strategy and sense of who's our customer and who's, who's not our customer. And if we were to be polarizing the market, what do we want to be polarizing about? Right. So that if we really stand for something, it means that we're probably standing against something else and you're going to splinter up that market share mm-hmm. and say, you know what, we really want this customer because strategically they're in align with what we can deliver on. Yep. And so that's, I guess the branding component is understanding what you can deliver, what you can deliver the promise on very well. Yep. And what small niche could you own the majority of before you expand beyond that audience. Does that scare a lot of companies as far as telling them like, listen, we got to be polarizing or else we fall into the fray. Yeah. Have you, do you get a lot of pushback about that, about, uh, uh, pushing clients away purposefully? Yeah. Um, I think everyone's afraid of anyone not liking them. So if you suggest that if for someone to really like what you're doing. Someone's going to not like what you're doing. Right. Um, it's just, everyone just wants everyone to like them because they want total market. Right. Right. Um, which isn't reality. No. And I think that what most people are afraid of is just the chance of losing an opportunity by cutting someone out. Mm -hmm. Um, our approach to it is usually identifying that ideal client, developing a persona, understanding what is that person going to want? What are they going to need? What's their fears? How do we help address that individual person and what we say or how we act inspired by that persona will resonate with a lot of people. Right. And we're not trying to cut anyone out. We're just trying to identify if this is what this person's going through, we are going to knock it out of the park for that person. Yeah. 
Uh, if the wrong person gets in and we accept that customer and we know we're not going to deliver 100%, yep. there's a lot of ways that could go wrong. Yeah. I really like that approach and and I it's played very well for me as well in that I haven't had a lot of clients that we didn't get along well. And I'm, I mean, on the podcast, I, I, I'll share about what I think and how I feel about certain things. Uh, I share a lot on YouTube about like builder education and, and how to educate clients and how they can be better customers. But I also talk about values a lot. And I find that the more I share about my values and, and our company values, that it, that kind of polarizes people in, in the fact that like, if they're just like, Hmm, that's not really important to me. So I think this guy's full of shit mm -hmm. versus if they're like, yeah, okay. I like that. I find that, that polarizing makes life a lot easier because yeah. you're attracting the right clients and you're just like, okay, well, yeah, I don't know why this is working out so well. Yeah. No. And I think another issue sometimes is that people might for better or worse, separate their own personal values away from the values of the company that they might be leading. Oh, like ethics versus business ethics. Right. And there could be a difference of feeling like, well, that's me personally. I'm right. different than me business wise. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't have any proof of this, but I feel like the most successful CEOs or owners have very strong values that matter a lot to them. Mm -hmm. And they try to surround themselves with people that share those values. And yep. the company ends up intrinsically taking those values on. Yep. And if everyone understands what those values are, and it's like a, a reliable compass that they never sway, yep. like there's a lot more longevity probably to that um, than someone that's trying to balance being and behaving differently mm -hmm. in life A or life B. Well, often when people aren't getting along, was uh, especially in the office place, a lot of times their values aren't aligned at all and they haven't taken the time to figure it out. And why, why can't these people get along or why can't I get along with this person? It's because you just, you're very, very different. You prioritize different. You, you treat people differently based on how you perceive the world. And yeah, you know, we've gotten into that problem before and you have, what you call like toxic people in the, in mm -hmm. the organization. And yeah it feels like it's, it's making things worse. And ultimately it comes back to the owner, the leadership, letting those things happen. Yeah. Hiring the wrong people and not letting the wrong people that are there go as soon as they realize they're not a good fit because it's hard to say, let's let this person go and try to hire someone to replace him. Cause there's a lot of work involved in that. Yep. But, uh, what's happened to me more times than not is just that person ends up quitting one day. And then you have to suddenly go find someone, That's right? right? Instead yeah, of like, let's work together. So you know what, this isn't kind of working out. Mm. And you feel it, we feel it. Is there a different role in our company that you think you'd be better suited to do? Right. Or is there something you'd rather be doing completely outside of our company? And how do we help you find that opportunity? How do you help us find someone to onboard and replace you? And let's try to do this together. Yeah. Because uh, typically one side or the other will surprise the other with ending. Yeah. Let's change gears a little bit. Is there anything that you've failed miserably at? Today? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say, yeah. I think every day, every week, there's failures for sure. Um, something that uh, I guess in the past year, I've been doing a lot of daily diaries and reflecting as much as I can. Nice. And uh, everything I hear from myself or from other people is everything they're learning is from all the failures they've made. Yeah. Very rarely do you learn from the successes. So uh, definitely I try to fail every day if I can. Yeah. If you could think about your journey so far and, and going back, talking to the 18 year old Kyle, what kind of advice would you give him? I think I would, if I would listen to myself, it would be to try to learn from as many people as possible and put myself into situations where I'm going to get to learn from people I feel I can learn from. In, in what extent? So I guess when you start out new business, looking for clients, potentially you're looking at any money will do. Um, if you're looking to get a job, which I've never done, maybe I should have done. Mm. Um, instead of just applying to a bunch of places I'd like to work. Yeah. Who are the people that work at those places that you'd want to learn from, that you think right. you'd learn the most from? Yeah. Find out who those people are 
that you'd want to work for so that you can learn the most you can and not worry so much about the name of the company, but more who do you get to learn from yeah. and focus more on that. On the client side, instead of just every dollar being equal, looking at which clients can I learn from and grow the, from the most. Yeah. Well, one of the things about, I mean, there's the, there's a saying work to learn, not to earn. And that hasn't been more true, you know, coming into the, especially during, you know, this, this COVID great resignation where people are, you know, contemplating their lives while they sit at home, wondering about, you know, what else they could do or why they're not happy or anything like that. Right. Uh, so th there's been no clear, clear, uh, uh, event that show people that skills and like people's minds and how they think and what they've learned and how they apply those is really what separates individuals. Right. And, and learning, uh, working for somebody it, it's, it's interesting from an owner's perspective and then from a, a beginner's perspective, you know, we are, we're hiring people if they don't know what they're doing, we're paying for their education. And it's like we're paying to send them to school while we're responsible to clean up their messes because they're going to make mistakes, right? In the hopes that eventually we can mold them and, and bring them up. From the other side, I mean, it is phenomenal. Just what you said, find somebody that you want to be like, that you can learn from, that you can learn a lot of skills from and get working, right? Like, I don't know if you can, if you can afford to not get paid, maybe that's something that people have to do. Uh, but as long as you're able to put food on the table and, and a roof over your head, uh, I think that learning skills is way more important very early on. Like uh, work experience to me is uh, you learn so much more than, than theoretical. Yeah. And I think the experience is probably the most important part of that skill building. It's the, right. whatever the skills are that you might be learning today. Um, the experience of learning those skills is really the important piece. Mm -hmm. Those skills might be unnecessary in five years, right? but the actual experience of learning those skills will help you learn the skills down the road. Right. So being a business owner very early on when you were starting your companies versus being a business owner now, take me through how that role has shifted and what your responsibilities are and where you focus your time now versus then. Maybe I'll bring this back to a question you asked that I didn't avoid on purpose, but I didn't really answer directly, okay. which was the, um, the, the biggest failure of my career, maybe. Um, so that would be running the businesses and being stuck in sales and delivery. So I'm the mm -hmm. bottleneck to that company's growth long-term, right? So if I'm involved in the sales process, I'm also involved in the delivery of the product or the service. Yep. There's no way for us to grow beyond my own capacity, yep. right? So that's probably my biggest mistake. And what's how long did that last? 27 years. How long has it been? <laughs> so I joined a group uh, called Collective 54 about uh, probably seven or eight months ago. Okay. And I've learned a lot through that group of um, identifying that I'm the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. I've got this hero syndrome where someone will do something, whether it's writing or design or ad concept, brand identity, whatever it is. They'll come to me and show me, hey, what do you think? And it's like, oh, this needs to be changed. This fix this, change that. And then it's good, yeah. right? Um, because I've been doing that for so long, people don't have to give it 100%. They can give it 70%. Yeah. Show it to me. Kyle's going to fix it. Kyle will tell me exactly what I need to do, and then it'll be out the door, Yeah. right? So because of that, I've robbed everyone that's worked for me, really, of growth and learning through mistakes and like... I was just trying to getting shit on by the client. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I went through my own experiences, I guess, have led me down a certain path mm -hmm. of documenting processes, procedures. When something goes a little bit wrong, how do we adjust things so that that little thing doesn't go wrong again mm -hmm. and just keep on making it better and better yeah. and trying to prevent mistakes is what I've been doing. Um, but now I'm feeling like preventing mistakes maybe wasn't the best way to 
grow a business, allowing people to make mistakes and learn from them and become um, capable of doing so much more mm-hmm. and removing myself from delivery and from sales would have taken us down a completely different path. And I don't know what that path would be. Right. But these new businesses that we're launching this year, I'm trying to design them from day one that employee number one will run that company. I'll be a fractional CEO. Right. And they can pull me in and I'll work on the next um, 24 to 36 months of revenue. What, mm-hmm. what should that look like? And have them work on the next zero to 12 months of revenue. Yeah. So looking at how to design myself out of the business model yep. and focus on almost being the, the founder and thinking about the vision, yeah. but then find a good operator to run that business. Right. Yeah. It makes your company so much more valuable when you're not the, the be all end all. Right. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about technology a little bit. How, how do you implement technology in your company and how have you seen it change over the last few years? If I go back um, 15 years ago, we were probably looking at building our own software in-house that would bend to the way that we did stuff. Okay. Now, the way I look at things is what's out there and can we bend the way we do our things to be in sync with what's available out of the box so that there's certain technologies that are out there that, you know what, it'll do 90% of what we need it to do the way that it is. Mm-hmm. We don't want to be a software development company. Let's do what we do. How deep are your pockets? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's do what we do. Use the software to help make our jobs a little bit easier. Yep. And adjust what we do in a way that the software and how we need to do our processes or procedures um, kind of create the best case scenario. Yep. Um, Technology is changing as fast as the world is changing. So you can't really use one piece of technology and assume it's going to be like that forever. You have to be adaptable to changes. Um, But you also don't want to be hopping up too many changes or having too much redundant technology in place. Mm -hmm. Um, Before you know it, your costs of technology are ballooning year over year over year. That's right. Um, And you have to make sure that it's the right technology for the right size of company that you're at. Right. So for example, there's marketing automation tools that are out there that are amazing. Um, but you could probably be paying anywhere from a hundred bucks a month to 1500 a month to 50,000 a month. Right. And making sure you have the right tool that enables your people to do more things. Do you find that a lot of companies have the right technology in place or a lot of it's wasteful and redundant? Yeah, I'd say it's probably in most cases not done efficiently and effectively. Yeah. Um, I'm not a fractional CTO or CIO, but I know from the people I've spoken to a lot of the times, there's just a lot of things are just where they are because of a lot of years of just based on that momentum, this yep. things are the way that they are. Right. Most companies probably We've don't have- We've always done it this way. Yeah. Right. Most companies probably don't have a, a really seasoned um, CTO or CIO on staff to mm-hmm. guide them and say, here, let's plan- our roadmap over the next year or three years of let's get things back in sync to what does this business model need? What are our people doing? What are they using? How do they use them? What do they need to do to do their roles effectively? Yeah. And what's the ultimate plan so that they have the right technology, the right security, the right privacy, the right backups, and the right systems that run very smoothly and effectively and don't have a lot of downtime yeah. and try to prevent that downtime. Um, but again, a lot of people just won't even know that's a thing. Yeah. Sounds like, uh, you know, the, f- the first principles kind of form versus function. Mm-hmm. So talking about uh, platforms and where you see things going, what, what kind of uh, social or platforms are, are playing the biggest right now? Like, wh- where are you guys seeing the, the most amount of return on investment again it depends on the brand and who's their target audience and where are they and where's the best place to intersect their lives to really contribute value to them okay um but if it's in social it it's a matter of are you on the most established platforms or are you on the most cutting edge ones you probably don't need to be on both um if you're looking to reach mass market in your own segment there's a lot of really good targeting tools there for digital advertising. There's great tools on social media as well for boosting. If you don't have 
as big of a budget and you want to be very selective in what you're promoting with mm-hmm. paid boosting can work really well on posts um who has the best organic reach i don't even know and again it would depend on who are you trying to reach um i guess which platform yeah, yeah like yeah and if if it, and if you can even deliver your offering through social so if you're targeting senior citizens and um you you have one product to sell you know they're all on facebook they are, yeah they could all be there right yeah. and it but it might make sense that um you can use it in a very light way but you then realize that you know what they're maybe not on that like they might even know about tiktok right right they might not understand what it is um Just seeing a bunch but of there might be other people that will never be on facebook and they're on tiktok all the time or a lot yeah. of people yeah. pulling away from social media and going somewhere else yeah. So again, it's it's really brand specific, probably, and who's the right target for them to resonate with. Yeah. That they can deliver a meaningful experience for, or meaningful information to, yeah. um, and just making sure it's the right fit. Because you can get stuck in producing a bunch of content for social media every month and spending quite a bit of money doing that. But is the ROI there or not? And it might not be. And are they tracking it? And are they tracking it? And are they tracking it effectively? And can you really track everything? Right. Um, some people ignore their brand experience. It's like, here's a customer journey. Let's mm-hmm. look at that and see how can we improve these points of contact? Are the customers happy or not happy? Oh. And work on looking at the loyalty and the repeat business of the referrals of your existing customers before you're spending a bunch of time on social trying to attract new ones. Mm-hmm. Have you ever had to call the Winnipeg Water and Waste Department? <laughs> no, i don't think so no don't <laughs> no ever no speaking of customer journey um so why why winnipeg are you from here yeah born and raised here yeah and and why run your business from here is that just simply because of the family because of the ties to winnipeg because you've always known it or it, it is there something about winnipeg that helps you versus hinders well it is mainly because of being born here having family here friends here Mm -hmm. uh, raising a family here so no plans on moving away um doing business here just because that's where i lived for my whole career yeah um today it's a little bit different with these business models and looking at how we can employ people from anywhere we have clients that could be around the globe and it's uh, very easy to deliver experience for them. Yep. That's valuable. And I can be talking to someone in uh, the Yukon from one till two. And then from three to four, I'm talking to someone in LA and there's no travel issues or delays or canceled flights or lost luggage. It's just um, bounce from one thing to the next. COVID really decimated your overhead. Hey. It did. Yeah. In, in a way, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a lot of companies with a lot of leases or own properties or things that they're kind of stuck with what they have. Yeah. Um, but looking farther ahead, um, business models are changed mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Do you find that new clients that you guys are, are getting new clients uh, from a certain part of the world? It's definitely more local. There's always a local tie, yeah. uh, whether it's uh, Winnipeg or Toronto or something nearby or someone works somewhere that's closer to us, yeah. uh, even if that company might be located or have people from all over the world. Yeah. There's always a local connection. Um, I had a chat with someone yesterday and they were just saying that, talking about what's going on in my life right now. And he's saying, he's someone maybe quite a bit older than me, um, saying it sounds like I've reached that point in my life where opportunities are now coming to me based on my reputation or what I've done over the past 25 years, mm-hmm. that now things are starting to come toward me uh, as a result at this time of my life. So again, being here, knowing people from here, it's amazing the uh, the type of wisdom and knowledge and connections that uh, are right next door. Do you think that'll change? Do you think that'll change from local reputation versus online reputation and how much they weigh against the company? It'll probably be like the importance of getting knowledge or wisdom from the physical library, getting it from the internet, getting it from a person that you can establish credibility with. Like everything's going to keep on probably moving around. Yeah. 
Um, so every 20 years or 25 years, things are dramatically different maybe, yeah. but uh, from every decade or so, and it's just anticipating the importance of those things are gonna go up and then they'll go down again. So I feel like the credibility of an individual is on its way up. Is there something that you or Vantage specifically believe or try to polarize an, an idea that goes against the, the norm in your industry? Well, I think that the way that we are doing things collaboratively with the client from the beginning with those vantage point workshops and really getting a true understanding of what they're about, yep. that was different than what a normal agency would do. An agency will normally walk in and tell you, here's what you're doing wrong. We'll do it for you. Yep. Um, and that whole world is, is what we feel like we've, we're done with that. Mm. Um, we don't think it's the most effective use of a client's dollar. We feel that a client will have people in-house that they want to invest in. So that's why we feel like we need to launch a completely new company that's going to focus on this fractional role mm -hmm. and try to bring that to market. Being a crazy uh, entrepreneur that will, you know, start something that feels like it's part of you and then work probably 90 hours a week or more because you can't really shut your brain off. Do you think, how much do you think about balance in your life as far as time, money, family, faith, like your own, your own well-being or awareness? Mm -hmm. Is that something that, that played a, have you thought of that very long? Do you think about it now? Well, I've definitely gone through a massive transformation myself in, from a year ago to today. Mm. Um, but a lot of the tools that I'm using every day or every week or having a coach, having a mentor, having different people around me that I didn't have before, mm -hmm. um, they're helping me and those tools are helping me stay balanced on things. Um, I'm feeling like I'm going to be doing a lot more than I had done before, um, but I don't believe it's going to get in the way of family or sleep. Uh, I used to have things going around in my mind. I could not get to sleep until I wrote those things down. And now I've got tools and methods that like the moment something's entering my mind, it's going into a system that I can rely on. And I'm, my brain is clear. Yeah. Um, I'm able to do things around the house that help make the home a little bit better. Yeah. Um, where before I would have felt like overwhelmed and stressed all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having these tools that um, help me organize my priorities, understand where everything fits into everything, big picture, yeah. um, for family, for friends, for work. Um, it's creating a sense of, of harmony that uh, definitely wasn't there before, but it's making me feel like I can be a lot more productive yeah. um, and I could take on a lot more without feeling like it's going to sabotage something else. Have you ever gotten into meditation? What, what do you think of meditation? Um, I feel like Pete's, um, there's been moments for sure that I felt like there's senses of what meditation is like for me in things where I'm not consciously trying to meditate, but I'm achieving, I think, a similar state. Um, if I'm doing something that has my attention on like painting, uh, on a canvas and I'm just painting something, yeah. I am completely focused on that thing. All the other situations in the world or at work completely escape me yeah. and I can find, and I can, I feel like completely revived and refreshed after doing that. Yeah. Um, if I go for a massage, the first 30 minutes of that massage, my brain is just going and I'm thinking of things and I'm having to write stuff down mm -hmm. until finally about 45 minutes is like finally zone out. All the craziness shuts off. Yeah. So there's definitely pieces of that. And I've tried doing some meditation, um, where I'm, I'm intentionally going to meditate now mm -hmm. and, and that's good, but right. I feel like I'm not practiced enough at that to make that work. But other right. things that I've done, I feel like I've achieved similar states of that, um, giving my brain a rest and, and allowing me to just be clear. But again, a lot of these other systems and tools that I'm using and people I have around me now mm -hmm. uh, are helping me stay focused and be more productive and, um, realizing that these routines that I try to do every day when I do my routines, yep. that day feels so amazing and productive. And I reflect at the end of the day yep. and days where I get swept away from 
whatever my routines would have been. Yeah. And I do things that are pulling me in other directions. I look back on that day if I remember to, and it's like that day completely was just a burn. Yeah. What's the most important part of your daily routine? It would be identifying my priorities for the day. Yep. I identify at least one. Do you do that in the morning or the night before? Um, it depends. Okay. Um, I do it every morning and some days if I'm an overachiever, I'll pre-plan the next day. Mm. Um, but it really depends on what's going on with family life and other things of whether or not I get to do that pre-planning that night before. Um, but every morning before I get into anything else, I've got my long-term goal that I want to work on some step towards something that's long-term and identify one to three items like that every day. Yeah. And then I've got one to three items that are short-term that I need to do this today. And it's a short-term related item. Um, so if I have those long-term goals and the short-term goals identified at the beginning of the day, as my day goes through, sometimes I, I'm on Zoom calls back to back, and then I come up for air for 15 minutes, I can check out that daily diary, look at my checklist of items and be like, okay, I'll knock that one off before my next call. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like uh, you've had some big influences in the last little bit. Would you say that those are the biggest, biggest influences in your life? And, you know, whether they are or not, who, who or what have been the biggest uh, factors or, or influences shaping who you are? I feel like it's a, like it's a, a bunch of dominoes. Like it's like not just one thing, mm -hmm. but it's a series of things. And um, I guess they've all led up to that maybe change in mindset where it was realizing that if I want to achieve or experience the things that I've always thought I would want to experience one day, um, the only way for me to achieve those things is if I'm not the one doing the things that I thought I needed to do to get there. So that change in mindset and realizing that I need to enable other people and empower other people and inspire other people. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I'm actually experiencing things I didn't know I wanted. So I had my productivity coach ask me if I wanted to do a meeting, like a call with a bunch of people that I haven't met before at 6 a.m. the next week. I was like, no, not really. <laughs> like, why would I want to do that at 6 a.m.? Yep. And I have done the 5 a.m. club and I have not stuck to that. I stay up late and work late and then I wake up at 7 and yep. get the kids breakfast and get their lunches, get them off to school and then try to get up a little bit early and get a little bit of work done before that. But it's mm -hmm. usually setting my priorities or reading a book until I get to an aha or whatever my little routines would be each morning. Yep. But the biggest change is that mindset of understanding that I need to inspire people. So when he said, my coach asked, would you do this early morning, 6 a.m. meeting? And I initially said, no. And then I said, but why? And he said, there's this group of people he's coaching in Toronto. It's a big company. There's about 20 people going through his, his training. And I had gone through the same training that they did. And at the end of that course, you do a bit of a presentation. Here's my hero's journey of like, here's where things were at. Here's what happened. Here's my kind of ignoring the call. Then here's what happened that made me take the call and then do more things that led me to a completely different perspective on life. Yep. So he asked, would I share that story with this group of people? And I said, yes, I'll do that because he thought it would help these people. I said, I just needed one extra week to prep. So did that, had this call one hour, went through the course of just telling my story, what it was like to take this training and how I came out of the other side. And my coach ended up texting me a screenshot of the text that he got from the person in charge of this other company that had these people in this course that I spoke to. And the text said that listening to Kyle speak was life-changing for my team. And I was like, oh, that was better than getting a big check in the mail. Yeah. Right. It was like, this is what I need to be doing. Talking to people about my stories, what I've done, what I've gone through, because it's going to help those people. Mm -hmm. And I don't get anything for it. That's okay. But is that true? And it you, really felt you, you, you in get, that moment. You get that feeling, right? Yeah. I felt like, you know what? I'm doing this for others. Yeah. And if I don't do anything else, at least today, I made a difference. Mm -hmm. And if I can feel that every day, 
I mean, what else am I working for? Yeah. I remember the first time that somebody came up to me after uh, I was speaking in front of a group. And I think he, it must have been a few years later. It was probably three years later. And he said, oh, you know, I, I asked you a question during one of your, one of your presentations. And uh, I, I didn't really remember it. But he said, uh, it, was about t- it, it was about time and effort and stuff like that. And I asked him if he watched TV. And I kind of came down on him pretty hard because he, he, he came in uh, with a little bit of an edge on his shoulder. And uh, he, he told me that after that presentation, he stopped watching less and less and less and less and less TV. And he was like, it changed my life. It was unbelievable. And I was just like, wow. You know, like that's the actual representation of what we're talking about. And somebody, they apply it and, you know, you feel amazing after. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the phrase, you, you don't know what you don't know. Is there anything that, you know, when you, when you thought about coming on here that either I should have asked you or you wanted to talk about um, that I didn't? I'm interested in, like I had mentioned, there's about five companies that we're probably launching this year. Mm-hmm. There's a few that I could probably speak to kind of the the zone in which they're heading. I would love to. that might, uh, you might have questions that relate to that or it might circle back to like kind of my purpose in Let's the do world, it. right? Yeah. So I guess one of them is related to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion okay. and trying to find a way to help workplaces uh, improve their culture yep. internally to be more open and inclusive to newcomers or different ethnicities or traditions or whatever that might be. Okay. So one of our new companies that we'll be launching this year will be focused on that area. Another one will be focused on building a membership community out of small to medium sized businesses across Canada, trying to see how can we help that community of businesses learn from each other, learn from other people that could help guide, whether it's marketing or sales training or wherever that could be, yep. to try to make the, the business community more connected than it is today so that more of the people that we've spoken to in the past and done workshops for, we've realized there's way more people out there than we have the capacity to help. So if we can create an opportunity for them to connect and help each other, that could lead to better things economically for Canada and create more opportunities for more employee employment for people across Canada as well. Yeah. Um, As I mentioned, we want to launch a new company that's going to focus on the fractional rules and that will be probably Vantage will eventually probably wind down and some people from Vantage will move over to this other company and that should start uh, next week, as I said. Mm -hmm. Um, How many is that? I've got another one that is focused on the mental health of kids in hockey. And oh, this is one that will big. be hopefully launching in the next two months. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're finding that anyone that we speak to in the hockey community, I am surprised. I maybe shouldn't be because we're not really in the hockey community. I grew up in the hockey community. My son played hockey from age five to six and then he quit. Right. right? So I haven't been experiencing this older uh, ages, mm-hmm. but um I see videos of parents or coaches or whoever just not acting in a very nice way. And I've spoken to a number of people that have kids in hockey, age 12, 14, 15, even um, NHLers or past NHLers, that they talk about every single parent on the team is awful. And it's not just one or two or three, but every single parent on the team is awful. I'm like, how can that be that bad? Um, So... The more people we talk to, the more we realize it's, it's, a, it's a really big issue. Um, and there's, I know a lot of people that have gone through a lot of mental health issues as a result of it or mm-hmm. things that are even more serious than that. And uh, someone's got to do something about it. And I don't know how, mm-hmm. but we're going to try to do something with this new startup that will launch soon. Um, it's just going to be about trying to make things back the way that they were when we grew up. So you're on the outdoor rink as a kid, just playing for fun. Everyone's happy. Everyone's having a blast. There's no coaches. There's no parents. And we're just there because we love the game. Right. Um, But it feels like that's lost. And we're hoping to see if there's some way to bring more awareness to things. 
Um, we're also looking at doing something that the soul, the, we're looking at every person that buys something from this new brand um, will be donating to Kids Help Fund. And then over time, there might be other charities or causes that make sense yep. to align with. Yep. Um, but for now, that's the way that we're looking at starting this uh, out of the gate, probably spring or summer this year. Yeah, yeah. So would that be from the the player side or from the parent side? And, and is this from a respect in sport, right? That a lot of the coaches have to go through. I don't know mm -hmm. if they, I, I don't know. I don't know if they make some of the psycho parents that have to take them before they can come back to the arena. But uh, I don't know if parents or I don't think parents are mandatory to take it yet. But uh, it's more of a like a you're almost battling psychology right now and therapy fa family therapy here yeah yeah so that's why again like well, we're not claiming to be an expert in this area yeah. we're just looking to see can we be a vehicle mm -hmm. for awareness and a vehicle for change and then try to connect the right things right. that need to be connected or yeah. pull the right play players potentially actual players in that mm -hmm. can speak to how it's affected them or people that they they've known yeah um, but really it's for focusing on the next generation of players right we can't fix what's in the past, but is there anything we could do to help ensure that the future of the sport is uh, better? You, you know how people, when they're, when they're driving a car and someone cuts them off or something like that, normal people turn into very psycho people very quickly. And I've always thought about it as far as like the, the potential for risk or, or, or the, the potential for injury is a lot higher in that situation, right? Mm -hmm. We're driving quickly, we can get hurt, um, emotions are, are raised up. It's very interesting that you mentioned what hockey has become and how people are slowly, it seems, getting more crazy about it. But I've heard a lot of talk about people talking about how expensive hockey has become, how much time it's taking, how much of the kids' lives it's taking up, and the the amount that parents are putting into it, not only financially, but emotionally and, you know, with their time and their effort, that it almost seems like the, the, um, the amount of potential damage is going up from, you know, a kid not performing or a kid mm -hmm. not uh, attending summer camps and you know all this stuff so it's almost like this weird perpetual thing is the the more it shifts the worse it becomes and you know how do we stop that and and turn it around yeah it's very interesting yeah and i'm one of those people that i'll be in the stands and i'll see something happen another parent do something or say something that really gets me angry but i'm not going to confront them i'm not going to say that's wrong the old Kyle would just sit back and be like, say nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And I feel like a lot of people are probably like me. They are just, they accept that there's someone saying something or doing something that's just not right. But what are you going to do? All right. Um, so one thought is if there's some kind of a brand that represents the sort of like the silent, um, I'm not sure what you could say or what you'd call it, but, I could wear something that would indicate to people like I believe in this thought, mm -hmm. this mindset for the sport, um, which is polarizing. So there's going to be a bunch of parents that would be like, maybe this person wearing this toque or this hat will get beat up by someone until there's enough people wearing it mm -hmm. and realizing like, okay, you know what? I might not be vocal, but I'll at least wear this hat that indicates I'm on the side of mental health for kids. Yep. And uh, forgot your first t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be a dick. Yeah. Yeah. Like as a, <laughs> when my, I remember a time where I think one of my kids was playing soccer and Tim bits soccer mm -hmm. and there was a, not even the coach, but the parent on the other side, and this could have been six year old soccer, was just steamrolling up and down the sidelines, running and yelling at their kid and ended up running over like a three year old toddler, right? Barely even stopped to see if this kid was okay. So he could keep on running and screaming at his kid in Timbit soccer, like age six. I'm like, what? Right. So I have little experiences or in, in hockey, I coached my kid for the first year or so. Yeah. And 
There is another kid on the team that would be like tripping and spearing and hooking other kids on our own team for taking his puck at practice or doing, it's like, what is going on? And this kid's father was a coach on the same team, completely just ignoring the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, it was making me sick to my stomach. This stuff is going on. I'm having to tell this kid, no, you can't do that. Someone's going to get hurt. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's, it's polarizing even at that age. Right. Well, that's like the difference between ethics and business ethics, right? There's parenting and sports parenting. Yeah. Like, you know, you got to teach them the same thing. Or I guess the, that parenting probably wasn't, uh, it was probably the same in hockey as it was at home. I guess so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and which, which most of this comes back to, right. Is yeah. So if a kid's being a dick on the ice, yeah, you could probably look at the parents pretty easily, I think. Yeah. And I mean, I, I did take that respect in sport and the coaching from, mm -hmm. uh, when I did those sessions as well, yeah. that you learn about the different kids and the different mentalities and the different reasons why they're there. It's, they really want to be there. They're there because their friends are there. They're there because their parents want them to be the next star. There's a lot of different reasons why they might be on the ice. Yep. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to coach every individual as an individual and not holistically as a team because mm -hmm. they all need, especially maybe at that age, they need uh, a certain kind of um, guidance in helping them grow and, and get better at the sport yeah. in, in a way that's going to resonate with them. Yeah. There is uh, there's, there's probably a lot more we could dive into, especially your, your charity work. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with these companies. So uh, I don't know how long you want to wait, but I would love for you to come back and uh, dive in and, and see how, see what becomes of this. Sounds That'd good. That'd be really cool. But thanks so much. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your, your experience and your journey. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, following what happens next. Great. Thanks. Look forward to it.